Good morning and welcome to this webinar. My name is Jonathan Goldsmith and I work with the European Lawyers Foundation. This morning's webinar is called Surveillance and the Impact of Modern Spyware Tools on Fundamental Rights. We're expecting a large crowd today. Some people are still being let in. And so we are beginning here with opening announcements. First of all, just to alert you to the fact that there's been a change to the order of the program. The program is the same, uh, but in fact, we will, beginning, we will be beginning with the European Data Supervisor, Mr. Wojciech Wieworowski, who will speak first and the rest of the programme will follow. There are a few important things to say. Here. The first thing yeah. to say is that the I cannot uh, hear. Let's see. questions, Peter McNamee, please put yourself on mute. The first question, the uh, first point to say is that the questions and answers um, we very much welcome questions from the audience uh, that you will find at the bottom of your screen a uh, question and answer box Q&A. Please, will you put your question there in the Q&A box? We're very happy if in the chat you introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, say hello to the other participants. We like that. We like to see who's present in our webinar. But if you've got questions for the speakers, which are very much welcomed, please put them in the Q&A box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer all the questions, but because there are a lot of participants, I see we have around 600 already in the room, uh, we may not be able to get round to all of them. Just for everybody's information, this webinar is being recorded. So please note that it's being recorded. Uh, it will be in English, no interpretation will be provided. Uh, we would ask you please to put your questions also in English. And the final uh, question that I need to deal with is to do with certificates, because a number of you will want a certificate to show that you've attended this training session. Uh, the European Lawyers Foundation itself does not uh, produce certificates. We will send the list of participants in today's webinar uh, and the time that you have been connected to the webinar to those bars which ask us for the list in terms of the recognition of the training. So please will you ask your bar if they will recognize this training as the European Lawyers Foundation will not itself issue any certificates. So that being the case, uh, we can now begin our program and I'm very pleased first of all to welcome our uh, opening speaker who will uh, set the scene for us and, and welcome us all and give some welcoming remarks uh, and that is James McGuill who is president of the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, the CCBE, which is one of the co-sponsors of today's uh, webinar along with the European Lawyers Foundation. James has also been in the past president of the Law Society of Ireland. James, over to you. Jonathan, thank you for those words. Colleagues, um, it's a great honour to be able to um, introduce this seminar on a really vitally important topic for practising lawyers. As a criminal lawyer myself, I'm very conscious of the sensitive nature of material that we get by way of instructions and the avarice of government bodies and law enforcement agencies to secure access to that, that information, whether legally or illegally. So I look forward to participating in this uh, seminar with you. Uh, again, I want to thank Jonathan and Alonso and Basilis uh, and the European Lawyers Foundation for putting together such an attractive programme. I'd like to welcome our uh, speakers, all of whom are uh, extremely uh, high calibre in this context. And um, without further ado, Jonathan, I wish you well at the seminar. Thank you very much indeed, James. So we move on, dead on time, perfect, uh, to our first uh, 
uh, session. And as I said, uh, the first session uh, will in fact be uh, the European Data Protection Supervisor, Mr. Wojciech Wiewarowski, whom we very much welcome to the session, who will be talking about the impact of modern spyware tools on fundamental rights, and particularly on the rights to privacy and data protection. He probably needs no introduction, but just very briefly, um, Mr. Wiewarowski has been the EDPS uh, since December 2019, having been appointed uh, jointly by the European Parliament and the Council for a five-year term. Uh, he has been very heavily involved in this area. Before that, he was effectively the Polish Data Protection Commissioner from 2010 to 2014. He was vice chair of the Working Party Article 29 in 2014. And in that year, he was appointed assistant European Data Protection Supervisor and then took over as Data Protection Supervisor, as I said, in 2019. He's also adjunct professor, professor in the Faculty of Law Administration of the University of Gdansk, and he's advised the Polish government extensively on issues relating to uh, e-government, information society, and data. Mr. Wiewiorowski, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm really honored by the fact that uh, I have the possibility to take part in this uh, uh, webinar, that I have the possibility to talk again with the lawyers, uh, whose interest in the problems of surveillance, in the problem of uh, getting to the information by the public authorities uh, is well known, and which we uh, also, uh, as data protection authorities, uh, are dealing with uh, on an everyday basis. Uh, the European Data Protection Supervisor is the, European, is the is data protection authority of the European Union institutions, bodies and uh, uh, agencies. So, I, I'm not uh, the one who is dealing with the data protection in each and every country of the European Union, but the one who is uh, supervising the institutions of the EU. But at the same time, the European Data Protection Supervisor is the main advisor of the EU institutions. So main advisor in the legislative process, wherever this, uh, whenever this legislative process go on, on the European level. So also, when the Parliament, the Council, and the Commission start to discuss the subject that is connected with the law, connected with the privacy law, connected with the right to privacy and right to data protection, this European Data Protection Supervisor, who is, uh, who is uh, expected to be the source of expert knowledge in the subject. Expert legal knowledge, expert technical knowledge, but also uh, the more broad societal approach to the problems that we meet. And it will be the part of our discussion today as well. Of course, the client and lawyer privilege is one part of the story and the part of the story which is the most interesting for those who are taking part in the webinar today. But we have to say that the problem is coming back and back again every few years with the discussions about the right of the law enforcement authorities secret services, national security agencies, to have an access to the communication between the people, including, of course, the communication between the lawyer and the client. Uh, the current interest somehow started or erupted again a year and a half ago when the knowledge about the activities done with the so-called Pegasus programs, Pegasus software, have been on the top of the agenda of the newspapers, TVs, and uh, social services. But actually, as I said, this problem is coming back and back again. And you, as the lawyers, are meeting that uh, in all the parts of the globe uh, on an everyday basis. So let's say what happened last year uh, and what happened uh, since the problem erupted uh, in uh, uh, the, the use of the Pegasus uh, software created by the, age, by the uh, company DPO, the, the company DSO, who is uh, uh, originated from Israel. Well, let's say that uh, the developments depend on the countries, but we have also the developments of the European level. So uh, in November last year, November 2021, the first hearing has been done in the parliament about the subject, which is actually the recall of the uh, 
discussions uh, which have been done in 2013 and 2014 after the Snowden revelations were actually not only the activities of the American secret services have been taken into scrutiny by the European Parliament, but the European Parliament started also to see how the situation looks like country by country in Europe. And the findings were not the really reassuring for the full control and full, full recognition of the use of different kinds of software. In 2015, we also had so-called hacking team scandal, the scandal connected with one of the companies which inside Europe has produced the spying software and sell, sold the spying software, both to the law enforcement authorities, but also to uh, different uh, private agencies in Europe and outside. So very similarly, as it happened later on with Pegasus, which was not produced in Europe, but actually also distributed here. And uh, November, as I said, was also the first time when the European Data Protection Supervisor has advised the Parliament in this uh, field, and also the moment when we prepared our own stand, our own position on the Pegasus software. Then the European Parliament started its activities very deeply. And uh, the first development definitely was the creation of the PEGA uh, committee, the committee which is devoted to uh, hearings and findings in the field of the Pegasus software used in Europe. What we got to know in this 10 months, we got to know more about the practical use. In 14 countries, 14 member states of the European Union, the Pegasus software was in use in different forms. Two of them has been struck down from the list of the users by Israel itself, because they were recognized as the one which are probably misusing the software, not using that the way that it should be done according to the license. And uh, the main problem actually, which we meet uh, during the discussions in the PEGA committee, during the discussion that you will be told more about by the members of the European Parliament, but in also among the data protection authorities that should be interested in it on an everyday basis, is the fact that uh, we never had the real discussion in Europe on what is the border in between the national security and uh, the activities, which are the law enforcement activities in the country. And uh, many of the uh, law enforcement agencies in the European Union are using the software for the purposes which are, uh, which are, con which are harmonized by the European law. But at the same time, a lot of the use is done in the exception part, which is the national security, which the European law is not dealing with. But at the same time, on the larger basis, the court in Strasbourg, the court of human rights, which is dealing with all the countries of geographical Europe, has the right to issue the judgments also on surveillance in the field of national security. So we have uh, actually the combination of these two factors, uh, the European law and the law of the Council of Europe, the law of the Strasbourg Court, which are creating the environment uh, in which you will be uh, discussing about uh, with the members of the European Parliament. But what I want to say mainly today is that the development of this software the development of different hardware solutions that exist in the uh, in Europe uh, is done mainly because we agree on that. We, you, and probably me. If I don't say it today, probably I'm the part of the problem as well. Why so? Because we are used to the fact that, that we are surveilled. We do surveil ourselves as well. I'm not saying about uh, the reaction on your clients' activities, although many of these clients, I'm not only saying about uh, the uh, people who are the who are the, your uh, your clients in the criminal cases, but also different kind of employers are surveilling employees. If we don't put the if we don't stress the fact that this is the surveillance as well, and it has to have the background, has to have the legal background as the any kind of surveillance has. Uh, 
then we also are the part of the problem of being used to have surveillance all around. Moreover, most of you can just use any kind of search engine and find out where is the closest spy shop in your area, in your neighborhood. I did it at the place where I, where I live and I was surprised. Actually, the spy shops are just over the corner. And you can buy the software, you can buy the hardware, which of course is not used for the, as Pegasus is, but is used to surveil our uh, children, our members of the family, maybe also the people who are appearing around. And if we agree that this kind of activity, this kind of uh, services are uh, allowed in the country, then we have to say people start to be used to the fact that everybody is listening to everybody. And the lawyer's client privilege is in danger because of the societal agreement on being surveilled. I, it's even hard for me to understand what will be the position of our children who are surveilled by their parents. But of course, I may say, you, you may say that I'm trying to water down the problem, while the problem is the activity of the, data, of the uh, authorities of the state and of the law enforcement authorities and uh, the secret services. Yes, that is. But uh, that led me to encourage you to uh, follow the case which is going on right now in Strasbourg. In the European Court of Human Rights, uh, there was a hearing on 27th of September in the case uh, which was started uh, by Mr. Pietrzak against Poland, my country of origin. I'm pointing to this case because while among the uh, complainants, you may find the NGOs uh, that are dealing with the, uh, with the privacy issues uh, and that are dealing with human rights, you also can find this first person on the list of complainants, Mr. Pietrzak, who is a dean of the Bar Association in the capital city of this country. And he also claims that there is no proper uh, control over the surveillance uh, activities which are done in the country he is in. Does it mean that the control over the surveillance is the problem? Yes, it is. It is actually the most important problem because whatever we may say about the possible ban on the software or possible ban on the hardware, we have to say that all the time for military purposes, for national security purposes, the software like that will be created. It will be created by the cybersecurity forces by the security forces of our military uh, military units. That means that it will be also used by the people who want to use that for the other purposes than for cyber security. It's always like that. So the problem is not the ban. If we will ban, it will not be 100% effective. The problem is to know what we do with all the software and the hardware as well, that is uh, at the moment on the market or is in the moment, at the moment, at the use of the law enforcement authorities. And what's the difference between the law enforcement authority and the authority which is dealing with the national security. And if this second one is for some reasons somehow uh, able to use the surveillance software, what is a kind of, uh, uh, control over that, supervision on that. I'm not saying that it's a data protection authority to do that. I'm saying that there should be independent supervisory uh, authority that will be able to check uh, how the software is used, but also how to punish those who are using that in the wrong way. I'm ready to answer the questions, but I think that the, a, a lot will be added to this European approach to the, to the subject uh, by the members of the European Parliament, both Mr. Lennart, but also uh, Mrs. Intfeld, are in the core, in the, in, the, in the heart of the discussion on Pegasus and the other surveillance tools 
all over Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. European Data Protection Supervisor. That was great. <clears throat> we have a couple of questions in the box. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, you feel able to answer them. Don't worry if you don't, and we can move on to our next speaker, Mr. Lenas. Uh, Alexandros Alexandru uh, is actually asking about uh, the publication of personal data. For instance, if there are data breaches which then appear in the dark web, I don't know whether your office has done anything about that area. If not, we can move on. So don't feel you have to answer. Yes, of course, the situations where the data is uh, available, no matter if this is in the dark web, deep web, or however we will call the places where the data is available, uh, that is a data breach, that is a data breach that has to be reported uh, and that we have to deal with. But of course, uh, the uh, the way that we do that, uh, our cooperation with the also with the police and law enforcement authorities depend on what kind of data has been breached and which way. So yes, data protection authorities uh, all over Europe and also outside of Europe are in, uh, involved in this activity, mainly through so-called the data breach notification systems. Thank you. Uh, the, the second question is putting a, a different perspective on it. We're used to, to lawyers, for instance, saying that we want no surveillance uh, whatsoever. Uh, Panayotis Azas is saying that from his point of view, he feels that everybody should be under surveillance, everybody, because he'd feel much safer knowing that nobody is betraying the country. And if, if, if he or she is nothing to, is not doing anything wrong, what have they to be afraid of? I don't know whether you have any comment on that, Mr. Vyabarovsky. I don't know if it's a fair comment, but I always remind the anecdotal but absolutely true situation that I had when I had when I was 10 years old. When I was 10 years old, I lived in the country which was a totalitarian country and had the martial law on. Martial law had been introduced by the communist authorities in 1981. And in 1982, there was a militiaman, so the policeman, the local policeman, who came to my school and said to us, to 10 years, 11 years old children, that we shouldn't be afraid that the police is surveilling the telecommunication, that they are listening to our telephone conversations, because they are looking only for bad people. They are not looking for the good ones. If you are the good one, you, don't, you should not be afraid. And I remember that as 11 years old child, I started to ask myself, who is deciding what is good and what is bad? And is this man who is here, and I'm not from the very rebellious family, uh, is this man who is here, this militiaman, is the one to decide who is doing good and who is doing bad? Uh, I don't think that uh, the world where we know everything about everybody is more safe uh, than the one that we have right now. But this is true that we were so afraid of 1984 that we went to the world which we may call the brave new world from Huxley. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes. One last question from one of your countrymen, Bartolomiej Tretowski, I'm sure I've not pronounced that right, who says he's an attorney from Poland. Uh, the public authorities offer a lot of software for official matters like ID on apps, online registration of letters, access to information of court cases. Can we be sure that we are safe using such tools which are provided by a public authority? Well, I, please don't uh, uh, associate it only with uh, Poland, my country of origin, because I cannot comment the internal situation in any of the countries. But I can say, you can trust them as much as you know about this software, and as you know that there are these uh, uh, supervisory authorities who know what this software is used for. If that was an open software, open, uh, uh, open uh, code software that was used for the tracking during the COVID times, I may say in most of the European countries, we could say it was safe. But if you don't know what is the code of the program, and you cannot see it, you cannot see what the pro, uh, the, this uh, system does, uh, and you don't know who supervises that, then be aware that uh, you, as a lawyer, you are responsible for the technology that you use. And there is no way to, get, to take this uh, responsibility out by just saying this is the publicly available program or this is the pro program which was provided by the, the government. This is the role of the lawyers to know what's going on. If you, 
if one who doesn't know how the, his system operates should not be a lawyer in 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Vyavrovsky. Um, and, and that's absolutely perfect. And we've arrived at the time for the next session. There is another question, but actually I think it is a question which leads perfectly into the next uh, session because it's a political question from Ioannis Seriotis, which is what is the present legal basis in Europe for surveillance and why is it done without the proper feedback from European citizens. So we're about to get a representative of European citizens addressing us. I hope you'll stay, Mr. Vyabrowski, in case there are further questions. But let me introduce our next speaker, who is Mr. Jeroen Lenars, um, who will be speaking about the work of the European Parliament Committee of Inquiry into these matters, the PEGA Committee, uh, as uh, Mr. Vyavrovsky has already uh, introduced uh, the work of this committee uh, very partly. Um, Mr. Uh, Lenars uh, is a Dutch member of the European Parliament for the Christian Democratic Appel, CDA, which is part of the European People's Party, the EPP. Uh, he's been a member of the Parliament since 2014. He chairs the, the PEGA committee, as I've said, and he's also spokesperson for the EPP in the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. And he is connected with other committees of the Parliament, Budgetary Control Committee, uh, Employment and Social Affairs, and the Budgets Committee. Mr. Lenars, very good. Uh, as you know, you'll be complimented by the rapporteur of your committee, uh, Ms. Interfelt, later. But please, if you would give us an overview of the work of your committee. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me today. I hope you can all hear me. Yes, we can. It's good. I just, just to double check. Thank you so much. Well, uh, as you said, indeed, the, the European Data Protection Supervisor, Mr. Wielowski, has already uh, did a good introduction about the work of our uh, committee. So let me just try to, to add on to that without um, repeating too much. So for us, I think what, what mainly sparked our interest was the, um, the reporting in the summer of last year uh, by Forbidden Stories uh, about the use of Pegasus, very invasive spyware uh, against a, a big diversity of, uh, of activists, lawyers, politicians, and mainly in Hungary and, and Poland. So that was summer uh, 2021. Uh, in the in the parliament, of course, this this led indeed to already a plenary debate in September 2021, and uh, a specific hearing also with the, the journalists from Forbidden Stories who broke the the story in the summer, uh, in in the committee on uh, on interference with democratic processes. Uh, for the EPP, uh, my group, we also organized a um, a, a hearing already with uh, among others uh, Roman Giltik, uh, lawyer. From, from Poland, uh, who, who has also been, been a topic of some of the work that you have done, uh, just because we really felt that this was a very, very important topic. And I think we did so uh, based this on, on the basis of three main considerations. First, that as a parliament, we always need to look at the perspective from the victims. Uh, and I think in that situation, we cannot overemphasize the severity of this situation because I think it's important for all of us. Everybody also participated today, everybody in the European Parliament, just to try and put ourselves in the position of those victims for a moment there. Try uh, to imagine that the government reads every single message you share with your loved ones, that every video you watch on your phone is being watched with you, that at all times, people that do not necessarily have your best interest at heart are aware of your exact whereabouts. Now, this should scare each and every one of us. I know it scares me, but my fear is nothing compared to the fears of journalists scrutinizing not so democratic governments, to opposition politicians, to activists, NGOs, lawyers who are considered an inconvenience by the powers that be in their particular countries. Uh, this is not only dangerous, right? it, it's life-threatening in certain instances. We've seen cases like with Mr. Khashoggi, for instance, we've seen in Mexico uh, where, where uh, people have, have paid the ultimate price in the end. And this is very serious and it's very concerning. And this is why 
from the European Parliament perspective, we need to stand behind and to fight alongside the victims of such spyware abuse and do so with, with strength and vigor. And this is also because, and this is, I think, also important for, uh, uh, for your uh, sector, it's not only about the direct victims. I mean, they are by far the most important, but there is a huge indirect effect, uh, a chilling effect on anybody that wants to speak out, to scrutinize government, to defend democracy and rule of law in certain countries, that wants to enjoy democratic freedom, to oppose ruling majorities. If you see that your colleagues are the victim of this kind of spyware, if you see that lawyers, journalists are targeted with this kind of spyware, I can totally imagine it would have a chilling effect on what um, your activities in this field would be. The second consideration is that for us, it's not about national security. It is about rule of law in the end. And for me, and there, of course, we can have political differences, but for me and for my party, it's also not about being allowed or not to use certain technologies to fight organized crime and terrorism, because I strongly believe Technological innovation can really help us in that area. Criminals and terrorists deploy more and more advanced technology and law enforcement needs to be able to, to follow suit. But that is not what this is about. This is about the abuse of technology for political gain and about the complete absence of proper checks and balances. And this is why I'm also very disappointed in the European Commission so far, because I really think the European Commission should be much more active in this area to protect the rule of law and to protect democracy in the European Union. We've heard so far, especially in the beginning of our work from the European Commission, that this is something that is for the national, for the member states. It's about national security and victims could uh, find redress or could find procedures in their member states to fight this. But what we forget here is that, first of all, these member states are, in this particular case, uh, the perpetrators, they are the ones using the spyware. So it's a bit nonsensical as uh, a victim to find redress with the perpetrator. Moreover, we've also seen uh, publications reporting about members of the European Commission being targeted, civil servants of the European Commission being targeted. So we've also asked the question to Commissioner Reinders, if you are so sure that this is about national security, do you really believe that you yourself were such a national security risk for a member state that this kind of targeting to you as a member of the European Commission is allowed? Because I certainly don't think so. It is not about national security. It is about rule of law, and we have to be very strong on that. And thirdly, what we said from the beginning, that this is not only about Poland and Hungary. I mean, Poland and Hungary were the ones that were in the news in the summer of 2021, but this is a European issue. It is Europe-wide, and we need to look at European solutions. It's also not only about Pegasus, even though, of course, the abbreviation of our committee is PEGA, it's the, 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 the name after Pegasus, but it very explicitly also in, in the mandate mentions equivalent spyware, because we know NSO Group is not the only manufacturer of this kind of spyware in the world. We know that are European companies. We know that there are European subsidiaries of other third countries, uh, companies that work in the, in the European Union. We know that there are member states who develop their own uh, technology. So we cannot only look at Poland and Hungary, and we cannot only look at Pegasus. We need to have a wide approach. And indeed, ever since we started working on this, we have seen new revelations. We've seen reporting about Greece, we've seen reporting about Spain. Uh, so it's very important that we look at each and every single situation. Now, so we decided as a parliament, and this was uh, today, exactly seven months ago, to set up a committee of inquiry, because what we've seen is that, um, yes, it's good to have plenary debates. Yes, it's good that there is uh, attention to the problem in the, the, the standing committees of the European Parliament. But we see that this was not adequate with regards to the scale of, of the problem. So we really need a specific focused committee to investigate it. And we set it up seven months ago with the formal mandate, the formal task to investigate the scope of alleged contraventions of maladministrations in the implementation of in the implementation of union law resulting from the use of Pegasus and equivalent surveillance spyware. And we want to collect. This is also a task. We want to collect information 
on the extent to which member states use intrusive surveillance in a way that violates the rights and freedoms of citizens. So we've been active for seven months now. We've spoken to, uh, I don't know, something about 70 interlocutors by now, technical experts, legal experts, fundamental rights experts, journalists, victims, government representatives, etc. These have been very, very useful and very valuable um, contributions of each and all of these experts. And we travel. We, met, we went to Israel in July for the first time to visit, uh, among others, the NSO group. And uh, Mr. Jurovsky already mentioned this. Um, we did receive the information there that 14 member states purchased licenses to use Pegasus. And in the meantime, two licenses indeed got suspended due to the abuse of the user agreement. So let that also sink in for a moment. We have two member states in the European Union whose licenses were suspended because they did not follow the rules for the use of this spyware set by the NSO group. And let's be <clears throat> fair about this. It's not that the, the threshold that is set by uh, private surveillance companies is, is extremely high. So two of the member states in the European Union were abusing the system in such a way <clears throat> that even NSO group and Israel said, this is not acceptable. We will suspend your license. Now, of course, we don't know which countries these are. Uh, we, of course, ask the question. We've asked it to NSO group. We've asked it to the member states or the member states themselves. We haven't received an answer uh, yet. But what we do know is that NSO does not have a uh, active policy in checking that all the standards and all the conditions are met. The only thing they do, at least this is how they explain it to us, if there are whistleblowers, if there are journalists who report on a certain story, then they will start investigate. Then they have <clears throat> logs of the use of Pegasus that they can check and see whether it was used indeed in the right way or um, when there's a problem. So what we do know is that the licenses that were suspended with almost certainty have to be of uh, member states that were in the news with regards to the use of Pegasus. So that is very much narrows the, um, the, potential, uh, the potential countries where, where this is the case. Uh, the second visit we did was to Poland. Uh, and, and I have to say that this was a very, a very concerning visit. First of all, because well, we spoke in 48 hours, I think we spoke to 50 people. Um, and they all painted a very dark picture of the general situation of rule of law in Poland, but also the, um, the, the context in which Pegasus was bought and used and what the um, effects are. So it was bought illegally by a fund that was not intended to be able to purchase this kind of, of software and through a subsidiary. Now, it was very difficult to uh, get any information officially because the Polish government used completely to cooperate with us. None of the uh, Polish ministers wanted to cooperate with us. Uh, none of the government representatives, including the Data Protection Office, including the, the Anti-Corruption Bureau, which is the, the bureau using um, Pegasus in Poland. So that is very disturbing. Um, and it is something that we need to we need to also actively look at because if governments don't cooperate, it's very hard to improve um, the situation. And this is not necessarily limited to Poland. Uh, we have sent uh, questionnaires to all of the member states with very basic but concrete questions about what is the legal basis for using this kind of software? Do you use this kind of software? Under what legal framework do you buy and use it? What are the checks and balances uh, that are present? Um, and so far, we have received very, very limited uh, replies because many governments are unwilling to cooperate. And many governments say uh, this is national security. It's a pretext of national security, even though, as I said before today, uh, I don't really believe that, that argument. And there I repeat my question, <clears throat> can we leave it really to the member states 
to, 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 to do this, because in the end, we have seen this in many cases, member states, governments are, are perpetrators instead of uh, a, a fair uh, judges on, on how to deal with the situation. So uh, Israel and Poland, we've been there. We will travel to Greece in the beginning of November and Hungary in February. And then, of course, at some point, we will deliver a, a report with our the information we found and the, the recommendations that we make. I will not uh, go into this in great detail because I think it's very early still. We still need to work. Uh, you will hear from our rapporteur, Sophie Innesfeld, uh, later in this session. Uh, she will be the one presenting the first draft of the report uh, next month if everything goes well. So I can't really say anything about the substance yet, but I can say uh, some of the, i share with you some of the, the thoughts at least that came up uh, in my head when we discussed um, with all these experts that we've met. Uh, first is, should we do something with uh, import export regulations in the field of the dual use regulation? Should we amend these? Should we change them in order to better address these kind of situations as well? Can we regulate the market on vulnerabilities, on zero day vulnerabilities? Can we do something about the stockpiling of vulnerabilities, because in the end, it is these zero day vulnerabilities, these weaknesses in, in software and hardware um, in the, the instruments that we use that are the basis for all these kinds of surveillance technology, whether it's Pegasus or Predator or whoever. Uh, what is the responsibility of tech companies with regards to updating uh, software, patching software? In the, the, making the criteria for, for software and hardware to, to have this at a, at a certain standard. Can we have minimum standards in the field of transparency? What about redress for victims if there is no uh, real route for proper redress and proper transparency at the national level? What kind of options can we have or create at the European level? Should we have minimum standards in the European Union about checks and balances, about the way that if you go to use this kind of software, how to use it under what conditions? Because yes, of course, national security also in the treaty uh, is, a, is a competence of the member states. But if we see the abuse and the scale of the abuse and the European context in which this abuse takes place, then I do think there is a cause for looking at this at the European level as well. And then something which I think is also uh, very interesting in, in, in this setting here today, because we need to look also at what is the, the legal situation of, 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 of well, let's call it indirect surveillance. Uh, yes, Mr. Giertik, I spoke to him already, or I spoke about him already. He's a lawyer. He was targeted. He was hacked about 18 times. Um, when you hack him, you also listen in or potentially listen in or can see and read everything he did with regards to his clients. One of his clients was Donald Tusk. At that point, he was uh, president of the European Council. So technically, even though the target was Mr. Giltik, there was also spying on the president of the European Council and many other clients that have should be under the protection of the lawyer client confidentiality. The same goes for us as members of the European Parliament. Last Thursday in Strasbourg, we had a hearing with members of the European Parliament that were the target of this kind of spyware. But if you spy on these colleagues, you technically also spy on many, many other members of the European Parliament who also have rights and immunities just because they are in contact or in the vicinity of the targets themselves. So these are uh, some of the questions that at least in the work that we've done so far have come up and where we need to look for answers. I think, however, that it's also an illusion uh, that we can solve this all at the European level. We need cooperation with the member states. We need national parliaments to get involved in a, in a much more active way in order to get answers to some of the basic questions that we have about the use of this kind of technology in the member states. And then it's very important that from the European Parliament, we do this in a way uh, that is truly European, that does not look at a single member state, that does not look at 
the political color or the, the nationality of governments to depend or, or focus on this. We need to look at this from a European level and come up with all the recommendations and all the ideas that we can do at the European level to improve the situation and to make sure that in the future, this kind of abuse on this scale against, and I repeat this because it's so important, against lawyers, against journalists, against activists, against opposition politicians, that this kind of abuse will no longer be possible in the future. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to, um, uh, to engage with you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Lenas. And there are indeed questions, uh, and so that's good. Uh, and so the first question comes from Tatiana Jacob, who says, Mr. Lenas, from the media sources, it appears that the clients of NSO Group are predominantly governments. However, there's nothing suggesting that public entities are the only ones that can have access to the data obtained by means of Pegasus or equivalent surveillance software. Has the PEGA committee had any evidence of the transmission of such surveillance data to private entities? Well, they, uh, of course, this is one of the, the, the main topics of discussion we've also had with uh, the NSO group on, on Pegasus concretely, because, um, of course, NSO group itself claims that they only sell to governments. Uh, we don't have any proof that it's sold, that it's sold the software to uh, uh, private entities, even though in the case of Poland, for instance, there was a, a, a private company that sort of um, acted as an intermediary between NSO Group and the, uh, the government. So <clears throat> it is not, not, a, not a rock hard um, uh, guarantee. We have no proof that the uh, governments in the European Union that possess the data uh, have shared this with um, with private entities, but of course we've seen also with other kinds of software that it has been used uh, also in uh, civil lawsuits, uh, for instance, where uh, where companies have used uh, private investigators with access to sort certain sorts of software to to find dirt on on their competitors. So it is certainly not a uh, not an impossibility. Uh, we still, and this is what we kept on pressing also in our questions with NSO Group, um, we, it's still a little bit unclear what exactly happens to the data. NSO Group claims if you use Pegasus, the end user, that's where the data is. It is not shared with Pegasus, it's not shared with Israel, but at the same time, NSO Group always has access to the system to provide software updates, to check uh, logs, etc. So if you ask me if I'm convinced that the, the system of, of data um, governance in Pegasus is, is watertight, I would say no. Thank you. I see Mr. Vyavorovsky has come online. If you want to say anything, Mr. Vyavorovsky, just raise your hand or start speaking and you're more than welcome to make a contribution. Um, I'm going to, you, you want to speak? No, uh, I'm going to skip actually. We have a question from Rupert Wolf. I'll come back to it because the next question from John Kane ties directly to what you've just been talking about. And he says, uh, how do you feel about a software company being the arbiter as to how this surveillance software is used? And given that the use case here is national security, just how secure is national security activity when the software company has such information? Um, th this is, yeah, so we don't know 100% sure what kind of information the software company has. Um, I, asked the, I asked the question, which was a little bit provocative to NSO Group itself, saying, listen, <clears throat> the fact that governments or agencies in countries need to purchase this software from you, in a way means that you are much smarter than these guys. So even if you would use that data, you could probably do it in a way that they would never notice because if they were smarter than you, they wouldn't need your services. So I think this is a this is a real risk uh, when it comes to NSO Group. And I think the point, uh, the first point you make is absolutely true. We have created a situation where NSO Group with Pegasus and the um, the Israeli government, because this is important to understand that any product that NSO Group sells to countries needs to have the approval of uh, the, it needs a, an export license from the Israeli government. 
so that these are the arbiters of who can buy this sort of software and who cannot. But if you see some of the clients in, uh, in, in, in the list of NSO, uh, you can really start doubting as to the severity of this, uh, this kind of arbitration. And it's important that they only look at the, the sell of the software. Like I said, they will only start looking into how the software is being used and whether this abides by the agreements once there is a whistleblower or once there are public uh, revelations about the use of the software in a certain country. There is no proactive uh, checks or balances from the part of the producer uh, with regards to the use of the software. And then, of course, very important to mention this as well, because it's not only about NSO. <coughs> NSO was willing, pardon, and as was willing to speak to us, and as was willing to, 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 to give answers to some of the questions we've had, uh, so far they have been unique in that regard. So there are many, many, many other private companies that uh, operate in complete darkness that also have dealings with governments, but also with private entities uh, where we do not have any information whatsoever. So there is a lot, a lot to be still discovered. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm suffering from the same bug as you are. Um, our next question comes from Rupert Wolf from Austria, indeed from the Austrian bar. And I want to welcome Rupert Wolf, who is an old, old friend of the CCBE and a former president of the CCBE. So welcome, Rupert. And he asks, is it intended to introduce specific EU regulations to protect data that was confided by the client to the lawyer to reinforce and strengthen lawyer-client privilege? Well, like, like I said at, at the end of my introduction, this is what we are um, uh, what we are concerned about because, and it's not only about client-lawyer confidentiality, it is for me also about the whole system of indirect surveillance because this, this kind of spyware is so invasive. And if you look at Pegasus, you don't even need to click on something. You don't need to make a mistake yourself. Once they send you something, it's on your phone. There's nothing you can do about it. You have no protection under the current technological uh, implementations whatsoever. And if they target you as a lawyer, it means that they, uh, through your phone, they can target all your clients at the same time. So I think this is something we need to look at, um, whether it's, it's feasible to, to introduce direct uh, European regulations on this particular issue for me at the moment, it's a bit early, uh, early to say because something we'll need to discuss. We have also asked for, um, and this is also part of our, of our work that we do, we have asked for uh, academic studies on what at the European legal level our possibilities are in, in many of these cases that I've mentioned today. So I think that's very important. And I see that Mr. Vivirovsky yes. uh, raised his hand so he can maybe say a bit more about this as well. Yes, and I've said this as well. For our for these kind of issues, it's very important for us also to cooperate very well with the European Data Protection Supervisor because they are uh, the, the true experts in these fields as well. Indeed, Mr. Vievrovsky, and I'm still conscious of the question which leads into this also from Ioannis Seriotis about the legal basis in Europe for surveillance. But but go ahead, Mr. Vievrovsky, and say what you've uh, you want to say. Well, thank you very much. I absolutely agree with everything that Mr. Lennart said uh, so far. Uh, definitely, that's uh, the European Commission who, know, who knows if the actions are already uh, uh, going on in preparation of such, a, such a legal solutions. But they, are, they definitely will be very hard because part of that uh, uh, is connected with the procedures, which are definitely uh, inside the uh, authority inside the authority of the member states. We already know that even if this uh, um, this uh, authority is shared between the member states and the European Union, uh, creation of the legal uh, ground and legal uh, uh, legal um, limit on the European level is not easy. That was a retention directive in 2006 that tried to do it, uh, and it was then annulled by the uh, Court of Justice, who decided. Uh, uh, that it goes too far in allowing the retention, while at the moment we have a situation where uh, the, the retention problem is uh, uh, regulated on the national level. But what I wanted to say is also that we have to, rem uh, that we have to be very careful on what we are 
uh, what we are limiting. Because the mere fact that you cannot use the effects of such a surveillance methods as the uh, prove as the evidence in the court is not enough, unfortunately, because uh, there are many representatives of the law enforcement authorities who said that apart from the uh, uh, data that is collected in order to uh, pre be presented in the court, there are also the traces that are created in, uh, that are co collected in order to understand the environment and then to get to know where to look for the evidences that can be used in the court. So the mere ban for the use in the uh, in the court, uh, the evidence is collected this way is not enough. And moreover, of course, it may uh, it, it, it may happen that uh, the uh, it happened last month that some of the countries uh, uh, lost their limitation for the illegal evidences. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, there is a one, one, one thing to, to add very briefly to that, because during our, our visit to, to Poland, I, I was quite surprised indeed that in Poland, and, and I know that the, the, Mr. Miroski cannot comment on, on, on internal affairs in, in, in the member states, but uh, that, that's sort of the, the fruit of the poisonous tree um, doctrine uh, in, since 2016 is allowed in Poland. Uh, so this was this was prohibited uh, before. Since 2016, it's allowed. It's, it seems to me a a direction chosen that, that goes against uh, many of the values that we hold dear at, at the European at the European level, and it's also something we we could take a look at uh, to see if that is something uh, that we, we see desirable for the future. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there is another question. I think it's more of a general political question, as I understand it, from uh, a lawyer, uh, Emanuela Uberti, who says, in my country, and I think in all countries, we lawyers are forced to use software and we are then consider ourselves responsible for the possible leak of data, which would be a huge problem. Uh, 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 she says, I believe the common interest in security must prevail over individual freedom, but how safe would a nation be which has no power of control over its own communications? I take this to be that rather like uh, the, uh, Pegasus is uh, by uh, Israel, that much of this software is created outside Europe and is outside our control. I don't know, Mr. Leonard, if you have a, a comment on that. Um I, I, I do because one thing that, of course, is a is a result of European uh, countries purchasing uh, software from a country a company like NSO Group, is that we provide NSO Group with a business model that also allows it to sell the same software to uh, many other countries that do not abide by any standards. So I think it's very uh, it's a very uh, negative consequence of us purchasing uh, this kind of software from third countries uh, manufacturers that we keep this model uh, alive. So there is something we need to look at. In a way, I agree with what she said that yes, our collective security uh, uh, in, in some cases can be more important than individual freedoms. But this all depends on the checks and balances that are in place for the use of this kind of software. And what we see, and this is the unfortunate situation in the European Union in 2022, that we have in certain countries, we have the official verdict that some of the judiciary in, uh, institutions lack independence or impartiality. And then how can you have effective checks and balances for the use of such software if we cannot have the, the, the confidence in the judicial system that it operates in an independent way. So this is also why Pegasus as itself and this kind of surveillance software is hugely important to investigate, but it takes place at the moment in the context of a rule of law crisis in certain member states that needs to be solved as well. Indeed, um, with perfect time. Yes, Mr. Vyavarovsky, please. Just one sentence of the comment. This is why we are so happy of the fact that this is CCBE that uh, uh, organized uh, today's webinar because there's an enormous role uh, in the uh, uh, ch in the chambers of commerce and in the uh, association of the professionals. Uh, and as far as the lawyers' uh, client privilege is concerned, that's mainly for the bar associations uh, to keep this discussion going on. And this is, this is also why I pointed the ongoing case in Strasbourg, because it is done by the 
lawyer, it is done by the uh, head of the local bar association. Very good. Thank you very much. I thank you both uh, extremely on behalf of all our participants. Um, I see that our next speaker, Sophie Intfeldt, uh, has appeared. I'd be very happy if our previous speakers remain, but I understand if you have other, other commitments. Uh, and we now move on to uh, part two of uh, the work of the PEGA committee. As we said earlier, uh, Ms. Interfelt uh, is the rapporteur uh, of, the, uh, of that committee. Um, she is a, has been a member of the European Parliament since 2004. She's a member of the Renew Europe Group and serves as the parliamentary leader of the delegation of the so Social Liberal Dutch Political Party, Democrats 66, D66 in the European uh, Parliament. And she's built her profile around a number of priorities, including the ones we're discussing today, privacy, fundamental rights, rule of law, but also migration and asylum and pensions. And she's connected with um, uh, a, a number of committees, one of them PEGA, but also the Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs Committee, Constitutional Affairs and Budgetary Control. Ms. Interfelt, we are delighted to see you. Um, uh, there is a question, just to keep in your back, I'm sure you'll be touching on this, uh, which can kind of, uh, as an opening from one of our participants, uh, Ioannis Seriotis, which is really about the balance between national security and fundamental rights uh, and how uh, member states can be sanctioned. So I'm sure you'll be touching on all those things. Over to you, Ms. Interfelt, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and apologies for not being able to, to join you uh, before. Uh, I, I haven't heard, of course, the intervention uh, by my colleague, Jeroen Lenaars, but uh, I'm sure that we, we concur. Um, to start with your last remark, uh, I don't believe that there should be a balance between national security and fundamental rights, because uh, in principle, the two should be complementary, they go together. Uh, and actually the protection of our fundamental rights actually also depends on national security and uh, the other way around. Um, and I have to say that to my taste, uh, national security is uh, too frequently invoked. Um, and there's not actually a definition of what it is, national securities, where are the boundaries what does it mean? What rules apply? What rules don't apply? It's not well defined. There's no European definition, despite the fact that for the last 20 years or so, we have passed a, a, a raft of legislation referring to uh, national security, although the European Union has no competence. Um, but when it comes to this specific issue of uh, what I will call the spyware scandal, uh, also dubbed uh, Europe's Watergate, um, I, there, there, there are, I think, three main points that I would like to make. Uh, first of all, it's, it is, of course, something that affects the privacy of individuals, but it also affects profoundly uh, our democracy. Uh, and it, is, it, it can be a great threat to our democracy. Second uh, point is that it is a fundamentally European issue, scandal, if you want. Uh, and I realize that everybody is looking at it through the prism of national politics, I mean, in Greece, in Poland, in, in, in Hungary, in, in Spain, but it's, um, uh, it, it's very much a European issue. And I will try to uh, illustrate that. Uh, and my third point is that the, the European Union as a political entity or as a, a governance structure is very ill-equipped to deal with this kind of situations. Um, to start with the first one, uh, of course, let's say security services, uh, police, law enforcement, uh, intelligence services, they need the tools to be able to do their job, to uh, detect crime and, and, and maybe terrorism uh, and, and to investigate and to prosecute. They need the tools. And as technology is developing, of course, those tools need to keep up with that development. Um, but if, if the tool of spyware in this case is not embedded in a, a proper legal framework with all the necessary safeguards, 
uh, and oversight, then it very easily becomes a tool for um, undermining democracy, even oppression. And we see signs of that uh, in, in European Union. Uh, for example, if you see that uh, the legal framework is not adequate in that it's, it's too vague, too broad, and it basically allows for uh, uh, you know, too broad a use of spyware. If oversight over security uh, agencies, special, special services, intelligence services is not adequate, this is a big problem because in, in most countries it's actually not adequate, not to say in all countries. If, uh, if there is no adequate recourse for, for the victims, for the targets, if um, uh, judicial authorization is, uh, you know, is, is not meaningful, uh, if it's basically a tick box exercise, or if there is no judicial authorization at all, if, uh, as you mentioned, national security is then invoked in order to cover up so that the victims have, and not just the victims, but the public has no access to, uh, to information. So they cannot even, you know, they don't even, they cannot even investigate. If um, political parties in government have uh, basically captured various institutions, which are, are part of this fabric meant for uh, oversight, safeguards, recourse, and what have you, then you know, ultimately you can get to, to a situation where the whole system is, is captured uh, and whereby there is no more, uh, wh where it's become a tool for control by the government parties. Uh, and, and we see situations like that in the European Union. So that's a big problem. Um, Secondly, I said it's a, um, uh, it is a profoundly European situation, Europe's Watergate, um, because we see that the European institutions are affected directly and indirectly. I mean, there have been MEPs who've been targeted, members of the European Commission, uh, members of the Council, uh, but we also see that, for example, if uh, it, it is established that spyware has been used to uh, manipulate or in the manipulation rather of elections. That also means that national elections influence the composition of uh, EU bodies. So uh, it's also influenced in that way. Uh, there are many European laws which are, which are uh, affected, um, which govern the situation, but which may have also been violated. Of course, the GDPR, e-privacy, but also, for example, export rules, procurement rules, uh, uh, rules on cybercrime, corruption. I mean, it, it's, it, it has a very broad scope and it's all European laws and also European, uh, the internal market, which is affected, police and justice cooperation, which is affected. So it, it's really a, a profoundly European system. Also, because we see that the, the trade in spyware is is taking place in the internal market and also with help of the internal market. There are spyware vendors who, who advertise by saying, oh, we're fully EU regulated. Nobody really knows what that means, but uh, it looks good. It's like a, like a, a kind of certificate of quality, if you want. Um, and uh, so there is, there is a lot of cross-border uh, activity. Many of the countries are involved, either governments who are spying on their citizens or, or countries that serve as an export hub or countries that serve as the preferred uh, banking, you know, uh, or, or fiscal home uh, to spyware vendors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, the final point is that I, I see that uh, the European Union is very ill-equipped to deal with this. Uh, and it relies entirely on, uh, on, on the presumption that member state governments will fully comply with European law. And that is simply not the case. And we see that the, the European institutions are, are, are a bit helpless um, when it turns out that member state governments are, are not respecting the law at all. We see that the European Commission is very hands-off, very reluctant to act uh, in this case. Uh, okay, it ha has expressed its concern and it has, written letters to uh, the four countries which are, are most in 
in the focus now because there we have big concerns over the use of spyware for political purposes, but that's about all. The Commission has been extremely reluctant to share any information about uh, th the fact that itself, the Commission itself has been hacked. But we also see, for example, Europol, which got new powers just a couple of months ago uh, for the very purpose of being, being more uh, effective in fighting crime in the European Union. Now we are talking here about cybercrime, corruption and extortion, three crimes that fall squarely within the remit of Europol. And yet we see that in this intergovernmental idea that EU bodies are working for the member state governments, that they're afraid to, 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 to address the, the violation of EU laws by, uh, by national governments. Uh, the European Parliament has, to my delight, decided um, ultimately to set up this committee of inquiry and the committee is, is working very diligently. Uh, but there too, I, I sense, uh, and so far that has not been, let's say, uh, an obstacle, but I do sense that national governments are very present in our debates as well. So if you, if you compare in conclusion with the original Watergate scandal uh, or, or, or this other uh, more recent attack, attack on democracy in the US, namely the, uh, the siege of Congress on the 6th of January last year, there we see that although the attack on democracy is, 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 is fierce, is vicious, we see that there are very strong federal structures that are still functioning and that are able to deal with that kind of situations. I mean, up to the point even of impeaching a president uh, like Nixon at the time or, uh, uh, or if having criminal investigations into former President Trump, it's still working. Uh, and here we see that the EU, EU institutions are, um, you know, they're, they're, they, they seem to think that it's impossible to tackle any wrongdoing by EU member states. And that is a, that's a problem. I would like to uh, conclude my introductory remarks here. Thank you very much <clears throat> indeed. Excuse me. Um, there are, ah, uh, I see a question has just arrived. I was going to ask you a question, but I see a question has just arrived in the question and answer uh, box. Uh, there's a question which is, it's, it's broader than spyware, although uh, related from Fiametta Cicetti, um, who says, do you think that COVID apps like the Italian Immuni, but I'm sure we're all used to uh, similar apps in our own member states, respect our fundamental rights? Uh, yes, well, that's indeed not spyware, but uh, no. COVID apps, uh, in principle, yes, uh, because they have to comply with GDPR. And I think when they were designed, uh, that was largely taken into account. But of course, you, you cannot exclude that uh, there are either uh, vulnerabilities in, in the system or that there, there is a deliberate backdoor that you can never exclude. You cannot legislate against bad intentions, but in principle, uh, they, should be, uh, they should be foolproof. Yes, sorry, that wasn't, as you rightly said, wasn't on the point. Maybe I can, before you came, uh, Mr. Lenas referred obliquely to your report, which I understand will be ready next week, and some of the questions which preceded you, not next week, you'll tell us, um, some of the questions which preceded you refer to the kind of mechanisms and recourse uh, which citizens might have, victims might have, including lawyer victims. Um, I don't know whether you can give us any uh, meat on, on what, which direction your report is going and which, what you're likely to recommend, please. Yes. Well, my report will be presented on the 8th of November um, because the, the, the inquiry committee will travel to Cyprus uh, and Greece and I will present my report after that. And of course, I'm already working on it, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, with regard to recourse, yes, that is a big problem. That's one of those safeguards which is, which is lacking. Um, uh, uh, and I see situations like uh, Poland, uh, Greece, Hungary, uh, Spain, where, where the, the targets, the victims, do not have access to any kind of information. Um, it's all either covered by national security or files were mysteriously uh, destroyed, as in, in, in the Greek case. Um, and, the, you know, they don't even, even if, let's say, 
uh, the use of spyware were justified by referring to a criminal investigation or something, then somebody is entitled to know what they are accused of or suspected of, and not even that they are they are they can they can find out. Of course, they don't get access to the let's say to the audit logs or the servers of the company, and this is all carefully kept secret by the governments as well. So and and then if uh, if if people want to to file a legal complaint. Uh, they go to the prosecutor, for example, the prosecutor says, well, do you have any proof? And of course they don't, because they don't have the means to, 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 to get that evidence. Um, and so that is then a reason for, for prosecutors or uh, in any case, prosecutors who are, let's say, more or less inclined to be government friendly uh, to decide not to investigate. Uh, we see the same, it's not just the individual victims, because quite frankly, I, I find the essence of this whole spyware uh, scandal is, is not even just the, uh, the individual victims, but the, the, the attack, the threat to our democracy and to the rule of law. Uh, and it shouldn't be on the shoulders of individuals to defend democracy and the rule of law. Uh, democracy and the rule of law should be defended by institutions. And we see that in some cases, like in Poland, we see that uh, spyware is part of a whole system whereby very systematically, methodically, deliberately, all the safeguards have been eliminated. Uh, all the oversight mechanisms have been eliminated. And basically, if you're a target in Poland, you have nowhere to go. Um, and that means that there is a system in place which can be used by the government uh, to fully control, you know, the population, uh, opposition, um, politicians, critics, uh, whistleblowers, what have you, and um, and that is extremely worrying. It means that you, if if the safeguards are gone and if oversight is gone, you have no more democracy. And of course, we there. It's not either your democracy or you're not. Um, there's a lot in between and some countries are definitely on the slippery slope. Uh, and therefore it is so annoying that, um, for example, when it comes to gathering information, in my view, uh, as soon as this scandal broke, Europol should have requested the member states uh, to investigate because Europol cannot act against the wishes of the member states. But now at least it has the power to add its own initiative, propose uh, an investigation, and then they put the onus on the member state governments to, to accept or, or reject. And if they reject, of course, they've got something to explain. The point is that I, my fear is that a lot of evidence has already disappeared and been destroyed. Um, uh, so that is, and, and, and as I said, not even institutions. If you look at, at Poland to stay with that example, the uh, uh, for example, the Court of Auditors, which is really willing to investigate very thoroughly, is being harassed, obstructed, intimidated, uh, gets no cooperation, uh, no information is shared. Uh, so then it becomes very, very difficult to get any kind of information on the table. And um, given, the, given the, the, the nature of spyware, it's easy enough to make every trace disappear. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> there is a question in the chat. Naughty person. Don't put the question in the chat. Put it in the question and answer box uh, from Polixeni Michalidou, but I shall read it because it raises the age old question which, you, which we raised at the start, which is to do with national security and fundamental rights. Uh, and it says, <clears throat> as long as the term national security remains undefined by the EU and left the EU members to define, how is it possible to follow and have legitimate EU rules on spyware? No, oh, absolutely spot on. And I mean, I made the remark at the start, and as a matter of fact, uh, I have had a, a bit of a, a tussle about this with the European Commission already, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, because as I said, there's something really strange where um, the Commission and member state governments say national security is a strictly national competence uh, you know, no entry for, uh, for EU institutions. At the same time, we pass one law after the next uh, on national security, uh, the collection of passenger data, collection of bank data, retention of com uh, communications data, definition of terrorism. I mean, it's, you know, all these rules are all based on, 
or, or with a reference to national security. Uh, and I asked the commission at the time, like, how does this work? I mean, are we or are we not in charge of national security? And then the commission starts to, you know, to try and find uh, an escape. But I think at the very least, there should be an obligation for member states to define in their national law exactly what the area of national security is and what it means. At least that, it's a bit like the minimum wage. You don't need one harmonized minimum wage, but at least there should be the obligation, as there will be now, for minimum wage. And the same for national security, so that people know uh, where the boundaries lie and, and what regime applies. Because the way it is today, I think you can safely say that national security has simply become an area of lawlessness. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there's another question uh, from Tommy Koy Vistoinen, um, who says, uh, isn't the entire planned European digital identity vulnerable in the same way? I don't know if you're competent to to answer well, on that. I'm, 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 I'm not familiar with all the technical details there, but look, the, the reality is that there is uh, technological progress and we're, we will use it. That's the reality. I mean, there's, there's, and I'm no technophobe, so I also have no reason to be, uh, to be against. Um, but the question is what safeguards do we have? Uh, what oversight do we have and what mechanisms, I mean, what av avenues are available to people to defend their rights? And here we have a big problem. Uh, for example, we have GDPR, which is a very good piece of legislation. But if national authorities, for whatever reason, uh, fail or refuse to apply it properly, we see that as an individual, you're left out in the cold. Because the only thing you can do if you're called Max Schrems, uh, you go to court, you litigate for five years, and then the court says uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, and that, but, you know, if you, I don't know if you follow the last couple of days. First, we had Safe Harbor. Uh, it was struck down by the courts at the initiative of Schrems. Then there was privacy. Schrems went to court. Uh, it was struck down. Now there is a third deal with the United States, and I have the suspicion there will be a Schrems three. Well, so, he said, he, he's quoted as saying he's looking uh, at it to see whether he needs uh, to go to court. Well, Sorry, we carry coined, on. We, we coined the, the sentence now that something has to be Schrems proof. <laughs> but, but the point is that ultimately, you know, this creates a lot of case law, but it doesn't actually protect people. Uh, and I think there has to be a fundamental rethink of the governance structures of the European Union, because here this intergovernmental mindset I mean, people think that that is something, you know, when you talk about institutions, that's something very academic and uh, people want concrete results, blah, blah, blah. No, it's fundamental. The way we have organized the European Union is, is determining completely the outcome of our legislation. And if we see, I mean, if I hear Europol say, oh, we cannot possibly investigate the member states because we work for the governments, I mean, it makes your heart sink. No, Europol does not work for the governments. It works for the citizens. Same goes for, for the European Commission. Well, okay, European Council is a lost cause. Uh, European Parliament, uh, EDPB, et cetera. Um, uh, and I, I think actually the only institution that is really operating in a truly European spirit at the moment is the European Public Prosecutor. Uh, and, and it's doing a fantastic job. And that is what I would expect from a body like Europol. If Europol had come in last year when the news first broke, they might have been able to secure some evidence. So I think it is guilty neglect that they haven't done so, that they haven't done everything with, within their powers to try and investigate this and, 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 and push the member states to allow them to investigate. Um, I think uh, as to recommendations, I'll be making lots of recommendations, but uh, some of them will, will say there has to be a framework, uh, a set of rules for the use of spyware. Uh, the Venice Commission has has made a, a very good list of criteria that have to be have to be met. Kind of checklist, if you want. Uh, I think there has to be a lot more transparency on the trade. Uh, let's say the purchase uh, of spyware, but also the whole the whole uh, spyware industry is like a very very shady, murky, semi underworld like. A business that has to be, uh, you know, they say daylight is the best disinfectant. Well, let's put some, let's shed some daylight on it. But also things like 
stockpiling vulnerabilities. That means sort of deliberately keeping vulnerabilities a secret so that they can be exploited for, uh, for spyware. That should simply be banned. Um, I think the commission should also uh, enforce much more strictly the existing rules like the dual use regulation, like procurement rules, like the GDPR, like e-privacy. Uh, they should all be applied much more, um, much more uh, strictly. Um, and I think we should also have a serious talk with Europol. Uh, Jeroen um, uh, Lenaar, the chair, has already, uh, at our request, sent a letter to Europol urging them to use their powers uh, and intervene. And, and maybe we can still secure some evidence. So I think um, it's not going to be one measure, but we need to propose a whole set of measures. Uh, and of course, uh, look, I will propose my report, but that is only, uh, that's not the end of the process because we still have a couple of months to go with the inquiry. So there will be, uh, there will be more information coming in and we will, you know, in the debate with amendments and everything, we will, we will uh, shape and, um, and, and, and direct the proposals. Thank you, thank you. We ought to move on, but before I do, I just uh, it's a point, and it actually it links perfectly with our next speaker, which is that before you came, there was a question from Rupert Wolf from Austria about whether there'd be some special protection for lawyer-client confidentiality. So maybe when you write your report, uh, given that all or nearly all our audience is made up of lawyers, that is a really great yeah. concern. If I may say something about that, because I, I also noticed that in the, the recent proposals by the European Commission uh, for media freedom, it has also included uh, some provisions for uh, pr protecting journalists against spyware. Okay, I'm not against that, but the point is um, they should already be protected. And lawyer-client privilege is already protected. So we would expect I mean, if there are still some gaps in the legislation, we will have to, 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 to close them. But I think the European Commission can and should do a lot more. We have, for example, we have European directives uh, on the rights of suspects and, and accused. And we, we have rules on uh, confidentiality of communicate. I mean, all those things exist. It's just that the European Commission is far too timid and too reticent uh, and, and not demanding. I mean, whistleblower, another one. Why isn't the commission a lot tougher on the member states uh, that have yet to, to completely transpose the whistleblower directive and not just ask them politely and then enter into 10 years of dialogues, but if member states do not respect the law, the commission has to take them to court. That's, that's why we have these possibilities. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I think you'll have, we have more than 800 people. You'll have more than 800 people cheering what you just said, but lawyer client confidentiality, I'm sure. Thank you. We should move on. I hope you'll be able to stay and I hope our other speakers are able to stay because there's a question and answer at the end. And as you've been speaking just now, more questions have come in. So please stay on. But we should move on to our next uh, and final uh, substantive session, which is to do with protection of lawyer client confidentiality in the context of surveillance activities. And we have a speaker Sebastian Cording, who is chair of the CCBE's Surveillance Working Group. Uh, so Sebastian is a board member of the Hanseatic Bar Association, a member of the Human Rights Committee of the German Federal Bar, and head of the working group set up by the CCBE, which I've just talked about, which looks at state surveillance of lawyer-client communications. He's a lawyer at CMS, which he joined in 1995, partner since 1998, and for more than 10 years, he's been heading up CMS's technology, media, and communications group in Germany. He has long experience in this field, complex IT and technology projects, dealing with clients from both sides of the, of the industry. Sebastian, please, over to you. Well, thank you very much, especially for the opportunity to talk here after these three very impressive, uh, I found, uh, presentations. And uh, all of them really, <laughs> um, really gave the message that I want to give uh, as well, that this is a really, really big problem. And it is especially a big problem uh, for lawyers in their communication with their clients. I prepared a presentation, which I will try to share now. I hope this is working. Let's see. Yes, we see it. You do see it. So when I start it now. 
You need to make it full screen. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm not... Perfect. Now you have it? Very yes. good. Okay. <laughs> so maybe before I start, a few comments to what we just heard. Um, there is one very interesting paper by the CCBE, uh, which uh, our committee has been involved about uh, the concept of national security which indeed is not a clearly defined term and that opens the gates to all kinds of things that really go against the rule of law. So I really recommend uh, this paper to be read. It's very easy to find with Google. And uh, um, as I said, that's uh, like some other papers I will mention, uh, a good read and highly recommended. Um, further comments that uh, it seemed a little bit what we just heard that uh, it's the member states who create all kinds of problems and the, the European Union uh, who should be the solution. That's, of course, the way it should be. But uh, I think, as we will see, uh, in some cases, actually, uh, not all of the legislative proposals that are coming from Europe really take into account this very important topic. So uh, Europe is not only the solution. And unfortunately, I believe it's also part of the problem. So um, I wanted to say a few words about the CCBE. You probably know that um, 45 countries are represented and 1 million lawyers. That's a big number. And uh, uh, so the CCBE tries to uh, be politically active and involve this weight into the political debate. Um, I have divided this presentation into three chapters, uh, first describing the problem then um, telling you why it is so important for lawyers and their clients, and then what the CCBE can do about it. Um, to illustrate the problem, I just uh, took some examples. There are more, as we have heard. Uh, there's not just a Pegasus spyware. There's plenty of spyware around. Uh, Julian Assange uh, is, uh, I think, one of the most prominent examples. Jones Day doesn't really directly involve surveillance, but uh, it, is, it does involve uh, the lawyer-client uh, privilege. We have the NSA. We also have a similar situation with the German Federal Intelligence Agency. And we have the European proposal of chat control, which I particularly find uh, very disturbing. <clears throat> so we heard a lot about Pegasus. We heard that there is really nothing you can do when you are a target. Uh, of this software. There's nothing you have to do on your phone. You do not make a mistake. The software is automatically installed. And this also happened to quite a number of lawyers, including the president of the Hungarian bar. And by, of course, uh, targeting a mobile device uh, with the software, all of the communication and all of the data on this device uh, uh, is being read, is being exploited and copied. And this, of course, includes uh, the communication between lawyer and client. Now, Julian Assange has been a target very uh, directly, specifically, and uh, so have been his lawyers. He, when he was at the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, there was a complete surveillance uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, all of the visitors had to give their devices to the security company who was uh, responsible for the security at the embassy. These devices, the computers, mobile phones have been copied. So all of the communication between Assange and his lawyers uh, has been copied. And uh, this has been done on the mandate uh, of the CIA. So the United States of America has all this information. And uh, we as the CCBE and also the lawyers who are involved here believe that a fair trial uh, in the United States is already because of this and also because of many other aspects uh, uh, not possible. And uh, therefore, uh, we believe that it is a great, great shame that he is still in prison and that he should be liberated immediately. And uh, I can really recommend the book that Niels Melzer, the former um, representative of uh, the United Nations for Human Rights uh, has written on the uh, on the whole uh, story, The Trial of Julian Assange, A Story of Persecution. It's a very, very good book and uh, um, also a very depressing one. 
Jones Day is a very interesting example because it shows the contempt, I have to say, that we sometimes find uh, for what actually should be clear from, uh, from the laws that we have. Um, VW had mandated this American law firm, the Munich office, and particularly to uh, do an internal investigation on the involvement of uh, Audi, in, uh, which is a subsidiary of Volkswagen, in the exhaust scandal to find out uh, which individuals had participated, who knew what. And uh, when this investigation had been terminated, the public prosecutor came to this law firm, took all of the files, and uh, made life much easier for them. Um, otherwise, they would have to do that research themselves. And uh, um, it is a little bit astounding and shocking, but uh, um, both uh, the claims of Jones Day and of the individual lawyers and of Volkswagen before the federal constitutional court uh, have been dismissed. Then the NSA, of course, you I don't have to say very much about this. You all know this, this Snowden revelations, and uh, um, there is some legal action going on in the United States. We do not know whether the surveillance of American citizens continues, but we can be sure that all of us, that all our email communication, WhatsApp communication, whatever tools you use, if American servers are involved, you can be sure that it is all recorded. Now, the German Federal Intelligence Agency basically does the same thing. There is a complete mass search of all the email traffic going on. Uh, allegedly, this only concerns email traffic with foreign countries, but the way they determine this is uh, they look at the ending of the email. So if you work like I do in an international law firm that has a com domain, then this will be uh, considered international. So we know that all of our email traffic, uh, if it is not encrypted, and most of, the uh, most of the communication is not because it is just simply too cumbersome, um, is read by the BND and automatically scanned. And uh, we also know that there is uh, no privileged treatment of lawyer-client communication. The BND doesn't even have a technical means uh, to, to see what is lawyer-client communication. So our emails are treated just like everybody else's emails. And then we have this uh, project of uh, the European Commission on Chat Control. The aim is to fight child pornography, and they want to create an obligation for the service providers who um, provide the messaging services or cloud services. And if there is a suspicion that one of these services is used for um, furthering child pornography, then um, there should be an obligation of these providers to scan all of the communication, all of the data that is stored with them. And that includes encrypted messages. That means, again, that they have to include backdoors in order to be able to read these messages and to, to see also the encrypted images and videos. And uh, so these backdoors, of course, can uh, also be exploited by people um, who uh, should not do this. And uh, um, as we heard before, that encryption could be a solution. Now it's the European Commission who wants uh, uh, to put a hole in this and to, to make uh, encryption more vulnerable. Um, this has been highly criticized by privacy advocates and uh, um, it needs to be stressed how important it is that encrypted messages are possible and of course, um, even apart from lawyer-client communication, which is not treated here as an exception. So there, the same rules apply. So these providers will also read lawyer-client communication. And uh, um, so even apart from this, I mean, I, I, I don't see that anybody can be happy knowing that all of the pictures he sends via WhatsApp and all the messages he writes that uh, uh, they will be completely surveilled, and this in the European Union. So for lawyers, what, what is at stake? Let me give you two quotes here. 
It is one of the most fundamental principles of protecting attorney-client relationships that we are able to have confidential and private meetings to discuss legal strategies, says Assange lawyer Jennifer Robinson. And the CCBE on the topic, the lawyer's obligation of confidentiality serves the interest of the administration of justice as well as the interest of the client. It is therefore entitled to special protection by the state. Actually, this is quite an old principle. It is nothing that is, has just been uh, discovered recently. Um, already in the 18th century, it was pretty, pretty clear that lawyers can only do their work if their communication with their clients is uh, confidential. Otherwise, the client will not uh, give all the necessary information to the lawyer, in particular, not the information that might be detrimental for him. And uh, so it was, it's, it's one of the oldest principles of the state of law uh, that this has, be, has to be respected. Um, we have two different concepts, uh, depending on where you're from, you're either familiar with LPP, legal professional privilege, or what we call in civil law, professional secrecy. I don't think I have to go into the details of the difference, but uh, the result pretty much is the same. It is protected by Article 6 and 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And of course, it is like every right, it is not absolute. Um, when a lawyer is suspected of being involved in criminal activity, of conspiring with his client to, I don't know, plan a bank robbery, of course, this is not uh, subject to protection, but uh, um, there has to be certain evidence, of course, uh, that a lawyer indeed is involved in criminal activity. So once again, the question, why is this so important? Um, as I said, um, when the lawyer cannot be sure and when the client cannot be sure that their communication is confidential, when they are not able to speak freely, then they will not be able to trust each other. And if there is no trust, then there is no effective legal representation. This is obviously very important in litigation and in criminal proceedings. Um, but uh, generally, this is, uh, uh, I think, one of the basic principles that uh, uh, is absolutely necessary so that we can uh, exercise our profession. Now, with modern communication, the internet, cloud storage, um, our data, our communication data, they're all over the place. And uh, uh, it is much easier um, with all the sophisticated technical surveillance uh, uh, tools that are in place um, to now really on a on a large scale um, uh, to uh, get this information that uh, before was maybe in one place in, in one lawyer's office uh, in his file and now it is spread out in the world and uh, uh, rather easy to find unfortunately so this makes it necessary that uh, additional new ways of protecting uh, this privilege uh, are introduced. And it is our impression that the legislators, both national and international, also the governments, other public institutions are not sufficiently aware uh, how important this issue is. So what does the CCBE now do in order to, uh, to try to tackle this problem? Um, the first thing that we did was create a guideline for lawmakers elaborating the principle and how the law should be drafted in order to, uh, to make sure that uh, the lawyer-client privilege is respected. And uh, because this is so important, and this is really the core of what we're talking about, I would like to read at least uh, the most important statements here to you. So the overarching principle is that any direct or indirect surveillance undertaken by the state should fall within the bounds of the rule of law, respecting the principle that all data and communications protected by legal professional privilege and by obligations of professional secrecy are inviolable and not amenable to interception or surveillance. So this is really clear and obvious, but... Uh, as we have seen, it is not respected, unfortunately. 
need for legislative control. We have heard this before as well. It's very important. All surveillance activities need to be regulated with adequate specificity through primary legislation, providing for explicit protection of lawyer-client communications. Also in the case of outsourcing of surveillance activities to private entities, the government must always remain fully in control of the entire surveillance process. Decryption of secured data may be permissible only if it is legally defined and following due process and prior judicial authorization. Scope of admissible interception. Only communications falling outside the scope of professional secrecy or legal professional privilege may be intercepted. No system protects communications where the lawyer is involved in the furtherance of a criminal purpose. The objective should be to ensure the inviolability of material which falls within the scope of lawyer-client confidentiality. Therefore, a warrant to intercept communications with a lawyer should not be granted unless there is compelling evidence that the material sought to be intercepted will not be protected by legal professional privilege or professional secrecy. Judicial and independent oversight. In the case of communications with lawyers, it is essential that judicial authorization is obtained in advance of the imposition of any interception measure. Moreover, there requires to be supervision at all stages of the surveillance procedure by an independent judicial body with the power to terminate interception and or destroy the material which has been intercepted. To that end, the oversight body must be given adequate powers by law in order to take enforceable decisions. Now, if you look at this and then you see that the European Commission wants to allow providers of chat tools to simply read everything, including communication between lawyers and clients, this absolutely goes against these principles. And uh, yes, it is uh, quite astounding that this is actually proposed by the European Commission. Use of intercepted material. Any intercepted material obtained without prior judicial authorization and in violation with the protection of client confidentiality should be ruled inadmissible in a court of law and be required to be destroyed. Any material lawfully obtained should be admissible as evidence. And the last one, legal remedies and sanctions. It is necessary that legal remedies are made available to lawyers and their clients who have been the subject of unlawful surveillance and that a system of sanctions be introduced. Lawyers and their clients have the right to be informed of the data collected as a result of direct or indirect surveillance. Once it has been disclosed, that surveillance measures have been undertaken. Now, the BND, for example, it uh, reads all of this communication, but nobody is ever informed that there is uh, uh, the surveillance going on and that these emails have been read. And therefore, of course, <laughs> it is not possible uh, to go against it, which is why. Uh, it was very difficult, uh, of course, then, if you do not know that it's happening, to take any legal measures. So what else except uh, writing these guidelines, which, as we see, are not uh, fully followed, unfortunately. What else is the CCB do doing? Um, on a regular basis, the CCB is making public statements and writing letters to the relevant authorities. This has been done, for example, with regard to the Pegasus scandal. Um, you find the link here, but you also find it easily with Google. Uh, the CCB has commented on uh, the situation of Julian Assange and uh, has demanded in uh, friendly words, of course, uh, his, uh, that he be set free. And uh, further CCB letters on Assange and also on the matter of chat control are in preparation. Can I just say, Sebastian, yes. we, we've got questions mounting up and we're going yes, to... Yes, just one, it's, it's the last, it's the last uh, thing I want to say here that of course, the CCBE is also supporting uh, cases that go before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, so this has been done uh, in the case against uh, the mass surveillance by the BND and also in the Meta Jones Day. The CCBE has the possibility here, which we do, in these two cases represented by CMS, uh, uh, to back these claims and uh, the European Court of Human Rights fortunately has decided to take on these cases. They only take approximately 2% of the complaints for decision. So this is quite a success. So also, of course, uh, the legal procedure can help to solve the problem. And of course, we participate in public events and cooperate with other institutions such as ELF. So this is why I'm here. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you very much indeed. Uh, can you unshare your screen so that we uh, go back? That was excellent. And uh, it doesn't just take me to say that, but we've had a number of comments in the chat to uh, ask if a uh, copy of your, you see people saying slides, very useful. If your slides can be circulated, yeah. they will, I will certainly... send it to you and then you can send it to all the participants. Or they'll be put on the ELF, uh, the European Lawyers Foundation and CCBE websites. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, but the questions, I'm not going to take the questions in the order, the chronological order, but really arising straight out of what you've just said. A couple of people have made more or less the same points. Uh, Rupert Wolf uh, has written in to say it's very important to have EU-wide uniform and high standards of protection of professional secrecy. In Austria, for example, there's no prohibition of evidence for data that was accidentally obtained as bycatch. And similarly, <clears throat> excuse me, Karin Pomaslova from the Czech Republic makes more or less the same point in a different way, saying that uh, client privilege between clients and lawyers is very limited in the Czech Republic uh, to competition issues and only between criminal offence attorney, attorney and client. Uh, there's needed a unified protection of confidentiality between lawyers and clients on EU level. I know that Ms. Interfelt also somewhat touched on this. Uh, so first of all, you, Sebastian, and I very happy if our speakers from uh, the European Parliament, uh, if they want to comment on that as well uh, about having unified levels, please. Yeah, well, it's such an important uh, principle that indeed it should be uh, protected uh, European wide on the, in the same way. But uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, the competence of the European Union uh, doesn't go that far. This is something that is still in the national domain. And uh, um, I think it would indeed be quite helpful that that could be changed. But thing, the way things are politically now, I think it's very difficult for the European Union uh, to actually uh, get more competences than they have now. There seems to be more a tendency of the national states to uh, to reclaim uh, competence which they once have granted to the European Union. So I'm not very hopeful here. So I think it is a political struggle that also has to take place in, in each country. Indeed, the, usually deontology is seen as a national competence. Ms. Interfeld, I see you've come on, on screen. Do you want to comment on this? Yes, well, I, I'm on the one hand, I'm afraid that the analysis of Mr. Cording is correct, that the, the, uh, at the moment, the political climate is profoundly intergovernmental and increasingly so. Uh, at the same time, um, um, let's say that even though competences have been uh, allocated through the European treaties, in practice, we see that, you know, it's very flexible, it can be interpreted in many different ways. I mean, we see the European Union uh, uh, entering into fields, policy fields that they've never done before, uh, without any competence. So, um, uh, and, and there's always, there is always this passerelle clause, as they say, uh, but I, I'm not so sure, to be honest, that it would not be EU competence. I mean, uh, I think parts of what the, 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 the topic that has been addressed by Mr. Cording are already laid down in, in different, across different pieces of legislation. The problem is not so much legislation. We can pass legislation. The problem is enforcement. Uh, and in this same intergovernmental climate, we see that uh, enforcement, and this has been demonstrated also by academic research, that uh, enforcement is, is uh, dropping very steeply. And that is the real problem, because even if you have these rules, uh, you know, if we see that certain governments just couldn't care less about European legislation, because they're breaking it the whole time and they know it. It's not by mistake, it's deliberate. So this is the real question. How are we going to ensure uh, proper enforcement? And that is indeed a bigger question, as Mr. Cording also said, than, uh, than just passing legislation. It's a bigger challenge. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both of you. On a, a similar topic of European legislation, and maybe for both of you as well, uh, Mario Reiner says, why not suggest European legislation on or regulations on the boundaries for the use of spyware by governments, like the GDPR legislation does? Uh, I don't know, maybe you touched on this as well, Ms. Interpel, but I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Well, uh, this is, I mean, the spy where the, 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 what, what they say is that they need it for national security. 
And as we heard, this is not a clearly defined term. You can base everything on national security and national, national security is outside of the competency of the European Union. That's, I think, the main problem here. Is it well, defense? Yeah, well, yes, it's outside the competence. But as I said, uh, there have been so many European laws uh, that were justified with a reference to national security. So apparently the, the definition is rather flexible. Uh, and yes, I do think and this will definitely be a part of my proposals and I have the feeling, but maybe Jeroen Lenaars will correct me if I'm wrong, I have the feeling that this is something that, that you know, across the political groups in the European Parliament uh, will receive support, that there has to be a legal framework for uh, the use of spyware. Uh, and as I said, I think that the, 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 the list of criteria put forward by the Venice Commission is probably a very good basis for that. Um, but again, how we will also need the institutions, the, 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 the arrangements to oversee the implementation and to intervene when member states do not respect the legislation. Because as I say, if, if I look at Poland at the moment, um, they're not respecting any rule and, and they're not even accepting the authority of the European Court of Justice. You know, and that means that most avenues are pretty much exhausted. If, if you don't even accept the authority of the Euro European Court of Justice anymore, then you know, what higher authority is there? We have a question from Giovanni Battista Gallus, who's a, a good friend of the European Lawyers Foundation and speaks on data protection, um, uh, asking what about the general use of hacking for law enforcement, not only using targeted spyware, but by way of compromising a whole communications platform as happened in recent cases. I don't know whether you have anything uh, to say about that aspect. Uh, well, we have been discussing the EncroChat. I think this is what he's referring to uh, in our committee. And uh, um, of course, this is something that is uh, has two sides, as many things do, of course. But uh, on the one hand, this was a very successful uh, attempt to uh, break into uh, certain uh, structures of organized crime uh, in the field of uh, drug trafficking. and. Uh, the possibility to not only uh, capture the uh, people who walk the streets, but the ones who organize the drug traffic. And so for the law enforcement authorities, it was seen as a big success. And uh, it seems that this tool has been used over 90% by criminals. So it is not like WhatsApp, for example, a tool that is used by the general public. So the number of people who have used this uh, for legal purposes and whose rights have been infringed here as well, of course, uh, is rather limited. But uh, still, I mean, this has been kind of, I mean, this is, it has been subject to uh, legal proceedings in France and the France French Constitutional Court has decided that this was legal, but it is something, of course, uh, uh, that uh, that is in some ways doubtful and hacking is something, is, is something that is used uh, also in other contexts. And, uh, uh, we heard this before, it's uh, part of the strategies of secret service to, uh, to use back doors in software and uh, not informing that they exist. So it, the interest of the secret service goes against the security of the software and uh, they use the same back doors that the criminals are using as well. And uh, obviously this is a big problem and obviously this shouldn't be taking place the way it does. Yeah, I think th three things. It's not just the criminals who are exploiting the vulnerabilities. It's also governments that are not democratic anymore. Uh, secondly, uh, they're, they're, if, if you use this kind of tools, and I mean, if we want to get, catch bad guys, they may be useful tools, although there's very little direct evidence for uh, you know, precisely how useful it is. But if you do, then you need the necessary safeguards and oversight. And then I just look at two very concrete, practical and recent examples. One is the uh, Committee for Oversight over Secret Services in the Netherlands, which is generally seen as uh, you know, a model. Everybody says it's, it's really good. But now twice already in a row, the, the head of that oversight body has resigned because they say, sorry, we cannot exercise any meaningful oversight because you know, the law is such that we don't have access to information, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
that should tell you something that's very alarming. The second thing, when it comes to safeguards, uh, I will not mention the country, but um, I have, I've done as a bit, a bit of strategic litigation, I have taken uh, an EU member state to court uh, over uh, its surveillance law, which in my view is too, too broad or contains too few safeguards. Uh, I started that case in uh, spring 2016. So that's six and a half years ago. Uh, I have, uh, after a year and a half or so, I got a, I got a, a, a ruling from the national court or two and a half years. Anyway, so three and a half, almost four years ago now, I have taken it to the court in Strasbourg. I haven't heard anything since. So yeah, it, it doesn't really matter what the ruling of the Strasbourg court is going to be because it's meaningless. Now, for me, this was strategic litigation, but imagine you're a real victim. It means that there is no effective redress. Yes, it exists on paper, but in practice, it doesn't exist at all. Thank you very much. We have outstanding questions, but we have reached midday, and I believe strictly in ending on the time comes to an end. So may I, on behalf of our well over 800, up to 1,000 participants, give my round of applause to all the speakers and say how fantastic it has been. We've seen from the chat, people have really loved it. I thank all the speakers. I'm glad to see Mr. Lenaz is there. Thank you, Ms. Interpelt. Thank you, Sebastian. That's all been absolutely fabulous. I'm sorry that the European Data Protection Supervisor's left. Sorry for those questions unanswered. Thank you to the speakers. We look forward to seeing you all again when we have our next webinar. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>